Body cells divide to repair damaged tissue and also for growth where more cells are produced. And this happens by mitosis where each cell produces two genetically identical daughter cells. The daughter cells are genetically identical because they have exactly the same DNA. They are also genetically identical to the parent cell by having exactly the same DNA as well. Cell division increases the total number of cells in multicellular organism during growth by mitosis. Both growth and repair require new cells and this is produced because of the cell cycle, a cyclic process of replication and cell division, where cells continuously replicate, then divide, replicate, divide and so on. Cell division involves mitosis where the nucleus divides and cytokinesis where the cytoplasm divides. The vast majority of the cell cycle is interphase. Cells with two copies of each chromosome are called diploid cells. Human body cells contain two copies of 23 chromosomes or a total of 46 chromosomes. The reason why they contain two copies is because one copy of each chromosome was inherited from both parents. For instance, for chromosome 1, one of the copies would have been inherited from the mother and the other copy inherited from the father. And this is why there is two copies of chromosome 1. This is the same for every other chromosome where one copy is inherited from the mother and the other copy is inherited from the father. And because there are two copies, that means the cell is diploid. A problem occurs during cell division because if you start off with two chromosome 1 and the cell divides, that means both daughter cells will end up with one chromosome 1. This would mean that you start off with 46 chromosomes and you'd end up with daughter cells that have got 23 chromosomes, causing the number of chromosomes to half each time a cell divides. To stop this from happening, DNA replicates before cell division. And this makes sure that both daughter cells have got two copies of every single chromosome, making a total of 46 chromosomes. So DNA replication before cell division ensures that both daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell, meaning that they become diploid. And it also makes sure that they are genetically identical by having exactly the same DNA. The replicated chromosomes look X-shaped and that's how you could identify that the DNA has replicated. DNA replication happens during interphase before mitosis. Another thing that happens during interphase is that the cell makes extra subcellular parts such as mitochondria so that it could function properly. After interphase, the cell divides, and this includes mitosis, where the nucleus divides, and cytokinesis, where the cytoplasm divides. Mitosis can be remembered through the acronym PMAT. P stands for prophase. Here, the nucleus membrane breaks down, and spindle fibers appear. Here we can see what we've got a cell that is diploid because it contains two copies of the chromosome. And then this is interphase because the DNA has replicated as shown by the X-shaped structure of the chromosomes. And then during prophase, these chromosomes condense, becoming shorter and fatter. The nuclear membrane also breaks down and spindle fibers start to appear. After prophase is metaphase, and this is where the replicate chromosomes line up on the equator of the cell. Then during anaphase, the replicate chromosomes separate and move to opposite poles by being pulled by the spindle fibers. And then in telophase, a nuclear membrane forms around each set of chromosome, separating the nucleus.
At the end of mitosis, there is a stage called cytokinesis, and here, a cell membrane forms between both tortoise cells to separate the cytoplasm. In addition, for plant cells, there is also the formation of cell walls between the daughter cells. Mitosis therefore results in two genetically identical diploid daughter cells. They are diploid because they have contain two copies of each chromosome, and they are also genetically identical. As you can see in the nucleus, they contain the same DNA or same chromosome. So here's a summary of mitosis. To recap, you've got interphase that happens before mitosis, where DNA replicates and extra subcellular parts are made, such as the mitochondria. And then mitosis is split into, up into four phases, remembered by PMAT. So you've got prophase, where chromosomes condense and get shorter and fatter. The nuclear membrane breaks down and spindle fibers appear. Then in metaphase, the replicated chromosomes line up on the equator. In anaphase, these replicated chromosomes are separated by the spindle fibers and are moved to opposite poles. And then in telophase, the nuclear membrane forms around each set of chromosome and the nucleus has fully divided. And then after mitosis, there's cytokinesis, where cell membrane forms between both daughter cells, and this divides the cytoplasm. And then in addition, cell walls also form between the daughter cells in plant cells. In an exam, you might have to identify the stages of mitosis. So here we've got prophase, where the chromosomes are condensed. Anaphase, where replicated chromosomes have separated and have been pulled to opposite poles by the spindle fibers. This is metaphase, where replicated chromosomes line up on the equator of the cell. And here you've got interphase before the DNA has replicated. Asexual reproduction relies on mitosis. Asexual reproduction is reproduction using just one parent, so there are no gametes or sex cells involved and no fertilization. This produces offspring that are clones, which means that the cells have exactly the same chromosome or DNA as the parent. They are genetically identical. The only way to produce these cells that are genetically identical is by mitosis, and this is why asexual reproduction relies on mitosis. Cancer is also involved in mitosis. Here, changes in the cells turns cells cancerous. And this is because these changes cause the cells to uncontrollably divide. The rapid cell division produces a lump of cells known as tumour. And these tumour can damage the body cells because they take away nutrients from other cells. You can see this in this video, you've got the cancerous cells, you can see that they are uncontrollably dividing at a faster rate than other cells in the body. And this forms the lump of cells called tumour. and the cancerous cells are taking away nutrients from other cells, therefore damaging the body. Growth is when there's an increase in size, either because the number of cells increase or the cells themselves increase in size. The number of cells increase by cell division involving mitosis. You can record growth by taking measurements over time such as the length or mass. A percentile growth curve shows the rate of growth expected for babies of different weights. A baby's growth is plotted on a set of percentile curves and that could indicate if the baby is growing normally or not.
In your exams, you might have to interpret growth curves. So to understand what a percentile curve is in the first place, using the example of the 75th percentile curve, a 75th percentile curve shows that 75% of babies have a mass below. This means that 25% of babies have a mass above the 75th percentile curve. So the number of the percentile curve indicates how much have a mass below or above. A typical question you would get is then what is the mass of a 4 month old baby on the 75th percentile curve. So you identify the 75th percentile curve, you look at 4 months old and you can see that the mass is 7.5 kilograms. Sometimes the question might ask, what is the mass or more than that mass? So in this case, it would be 100 minus the percentile curve number. For instance, at 10 months old, what percentage of boys have a mass of 8 kilogram or more? So you look at 10 months old, here's 8 kilograms, and this is on the 9th percentile curve. This means that 9% of babies have a mass of 8 kilograms or less. So here the question is asking what is the percentage of 8 kilograms or more. So 100 minus the 9, that's 91% of babies have a mass of 8 kilograms or more. Measurements from babies are plotted on a percentile chart and there are two ways these plotted lines can suggest if the growth and development of a baby is normal. A normal growth should remain near or very close to the same percentile curve as the baby gets older. As long as the growth rate doesn't cross over more than one percentile curve, the growth is normal. Therefore, if the potted chart crosses more than one percentile curve, this could indicate that the growth is not normal. Another indication might be that the plotted line goes above the 99.6 or below the 0 0.4 percentile curve. Notice that the 50 percentile curve shows the growth of a baby that is the average of the population. This is because in the 50 percentile curve, the mass below would be 50 percent and the mass above also be 50 percent. Being on the 50 percentile curve doesn't mean that you're normal. You could be above or below that and still be normal as well. Now, as a zygote, a fertilized egg develops into an embryo, there is the addition of cells by mitosis, and this means that you are producing cells that are genetically identical. As the embryo develops into a fetus, these cells become more specialized, so they can have different functions. For instance, they become blood cells, liver cells, muscle cells, or various other types of cells. To become more specialized, so that they can do different functions, involves a process called differentiation. Therefore growth in animals where you are adding more cells involves these unspecialized cells dividing by mitosis to produce more unspecialized cells and then the unspecialized cells have to become more specialized by differentiation. So growth in animals involves two stages. First mitosis to produce more cells and then these cells have to become more specialized by differentiation and those are the two stages involved in growth in animals. Plant growth is very similar where the addition of cells increases the size of the plant. This happens involving meristem cells which are located on the tips of roots and shoots. Just like in animals these stem cells divide by mitosis. However, the daughter cells that are produced then elongate, which is something you would have learnt in, or will learn in the future involving auxins. 
Elongation means that the cells get longer and after they get longer then they differentiate by becoming to become more specialized. This means that the cells can have different functions. So growth in plant involves three stages. Mitosis for the cell to divide to produce unspecialized cells. And then these cells increase in length, which means that they elongate. And then finally they differentiate to become more specialized so they can have different functions. So plant growth is slightly different to animal growth because there are three stages instead of two. There's cell division, the extra stage of elongation, which is what causes the growth of plants. That increase in length of the cells increases the size of the plant. And then just like animal cells, there's differentiation for the cells to become more specialized. Growth in the shoot happens exactly like growth in the roots. So it involves the same three stages where meristem cells divide by mitosis, which produces more unspecialized cells. These cells elongate and increases the length of the plant. And then they differentiate to become more specialized. An example in the roots would be the root hair cells produced, which have an increased surface area so that they can absorb more water and minerals. For plants to grow, they need food, and this does not come from the soil. And this was shown by a famous scientist called Van Helmont, who measured the mass of a tree and then did the same thing five years later to see where the increase in mass came from. To find out the percentage change in mass or the growth in plants is the final value minus the starting value divided by the starting value multiplied by 100 because it's a percentage. So here it would be 76.74 minus 2.27. You divide this by 2.27 and then multiply it by 100. So this plant here in Van Helmont's famous experiment, the mass increased by 3,281%. Stem cells are unspecialized cells and these unspecialized cells can do two things. First they divide by mitosis and because mitosis produces genetically identical cells that means that the cells produced would also be unspecialized. And then these unspecialized cells become more specialized by differentiation. So here's an example of stem cells that are unspecialized. They don't have any cell structures, so they don't perform any specific functions. And then they become more specialized by differentiation, by having these cell structures. And these cell structures can therefore help them perform the specific functions that they need to do. So here's an example of a stem cell. There are two things it could do. First, it could do mitosis to produce more unspecialized cells. And then those cells that are produced become more specialized by differentiation so that they could have different functions. There are three different types of stem cells you need to know. So we already discussed the stem cells found in plants called meristem cells and these meristem cells are found in the tips of roots and shoots. They're unspecialized cells. They do mitosis where the cell divides, so producing more unspecialized cells and then these unspecialized cells differentiate into any type of specialized cells that the plant needs. Another type of stem cell is one found in animals and these are embryonic stem cells. And these embryonic stem cells are produced in early stage embryo. The stem cell again, they do mitosis to produce more cells and the cells become specialized so they can perform different functions by differentiation. And these embryonic stem cells, they can become any type of cell. 
because they are unspecialized. And then the third type of stem cells you need to know are tissue specific adult stem cells. And these are stem cells where as a young animal develops, these stem cells are located in specific tissues that are already specialized. So these tissue specific adult stem cells are partially specialized. For instance, tissue specific adult stem cells can be found in the bone marrow. And when they become more specialized by differentiation, they could only turn into blood cells. They cannot turn into any other type of cell because they are already partially specialized. So tissue specific stem cells come from body tissues and they are limited to only producing specialized cells in the tissues that they're located in. For instance, the bone marrow adult stem cells could only turn into blood cells. And they do this by mitosis to produce more cells and then these cells differentiate but can only turn into specialized cells in tissues around them. So here's a summary of all three types of stem cells you need to know. You've got embryonic stem cells that are located in early stage embryo and they are unspecialized cells so they can develop into any type of specialized cell. You've got tissue specific adult stem cells and these are partially specialized so that means they're limited to only producing specialized cells in tissues around them to replace old or damaged cells and then you've got ste meristem cells they are also unspecialized they are unspecialized they produce new specialized cells during the lifetime of a pr of a plant for growth notice that animals stop growing once they reach adult because they only have tissue specific adult stem cells and because they're partially specialized they can't turn into any other type of cell they are limited to the type of specialized cells they could turn into and that's why animals stop growing at a certain age so a little recap on the difference between tissue specific adult stem cells and embryonic stem cells. In comparison, both of them can divide by mitosis to produce more unspecialized cells and then these special they become more specialized by differentiation. Difference is that tissue specific adult stem cells are found in tissues that are already specialized whereas embryonic stem cells are in early stage embryo. The adult stem cells can produce cells that differentiated into a limited range of specialized cells because they're partially specialized whereas embryonic stem cells can develop into any type of cell because they are fully unspecialized. One advantage of stem cells is the use in medicine. So for example, explain how stem cells could be used to help repair damaged heart muscle cells in someone who has a heart attack. Here you would inject heart stem cells and these are the tissue specific adult stem cells into a person's heart and because we said earlier the stem cells do two things first they do mitosis so that produces more of the stem cells and then these stem cells will then differentiate into new heart muscle cells to replace the ones that are damaged notice that when you're injecting them into the location of the damaged tissue or organ you are replacing the damaged cells, you are not repairing them. So stem cells used in medicine have an application where you inject them into the organ or tissue that's damaged and they are replacing the damaged cells because these stem cells first do mitosis and then they differentiate to become more specialized into the cells that they are now located in. And this could be done with other uh, organs and tissues where adult stem cells are naturally found. There are however risks with using stem cells in medicine. So one of the first things that stem cells can do is they could divide by mitosis 
and if they divide by mitosis uncontrollably this means that these cells become cancerous taking away nutrients from other cells another problem for of stem cells is often they're killed by the immune system the white blood cells of the recipient and this means that these stem cells are rejected What cells are your brain mainly made of and how were they first produced? So this relates to stem cells. So we already know that the zygote, the fertilized egg, first develops and increases the number of cells until it reaches and becomes an embryo and this happens through mitosis. So all of these cells are genetically identical. And then these cells have different functions because they become specialized and this means that they become more specialized by differentiation so one of these cells in the embryo will become more specialized into the cells that make up your brain and these cells that make up your brain are mainly neurons which are nerve cells you should be able to identify the different parts of your brain. So we've got the cerebral cortex, which is divided into two cerebral hemispheres. Then below that we've got the cerebellum. And then we've also got the medulla oblongata, which connects the brain to the spinal cord. And then the spinal cord contain, connects the brain to the rest of the body. For each part of the brain, you need to know the functions of what they do. So the cerebral cortex is involved in consciousness and language and is also involved mainly for senses, memory and behaviour. The cerebellum is involved in both balance and posture and is also involved in coordinating fine control of muscle activity. In the exam you should mention is fine control of the muscle activity not controlling the muscle. So fine control means making those move, small movements of your body using the muscles. Then the medulla oblongata controls both the uh, heart and breathing rate. It's also involved in reflexes as well. And then the spinal cord connects the brain with the rest of the body. And here is a summary of both the structures and the functions of the different parts of the brain and the spinal cord. Now, if you want to study a healthy individual without risking or damaging their brain, there are two different types of scans you can perform. A CT scan shows the shape or structures of the brain. And this involves using x-ray. So here you could see one thing that you could identify because of the changes in the shape or structures is a brain tumour. So that is one use of a CT scan. We mentioned earlier that cancer is when there are changes happening to cells where these cells uncontrollably divide and that means they form a lump of cells called tumour. So that tumour in the brain changes the shape and structure and this can be identified using CT scans. Another type of scan you can use for the brain is a PET scan. And a PET scan shows brain activity where the patient is injected with radioactive molecules such as glucose. And we could then match the activities that a person is doing with the part of the brain that's being used. So for instance, if you carry out an activity like listening, you can see where the radiation is being emitted and detect that. And that will locate which part of the brain is active during that activity. So a PET scan is different to a CT scan because not only does it show you the structures of the brain, it could also show you the activity in that part of the brain. And you could then link that to that activity a person is carrying out. And here's a summary of both types of scanning, CT and PET scan. 
We said earlier, spinal cord links the brain to the rest of the body. So sometimes the spinal cord could get damaged and this means that the information that is transmitted from the brain to the rest of the body or vice versa would be reduced. Now earlier we said that we could replace damaged cells by using tissue specific adult stem cells. Unfortunately there are no tissue specific adult stem cells that could develop into neurons in the brain. So if the spinal cord or the spinal cord. So if the spinal cord gets damaged, that means that you can't re replace or repair those uh, neurons that are damaged. However, as we mentioned earlier, maybe we could inject stem cells to replace those damaged cells. Now we mentioned earlier that cancer is changes in cells where the cells uncontrollably divide and we talked about brain tumours where this cell division happens in the brain uncontrollably. One way of treating the tumour is to cut out the tumour from the brain but that could be dangerous. So an alternative method is by killing these cells using radiotherapy and this kills the active dividing cells. The only problem with radiotherapy is also kills other actively dividing cells that are healthy. So it damages those healthy cells as well. An alternative to using radiotherapy is chemotherapy and this is where drugs are injected that kills the actively dividing cells. But again the same issue happens, you could kill actively dividing cells that are healthy and the other problem with chemotherapy for brain tumours is that there is a blood-brain barrier that stops chemicals from reaching the blood. So you can see in a normal blood vessel, chem certain chemicals can get through and reach body cells, but in the brain, there are no pores in the brain region of, for these blood vessels, so it's very difficult for drugs to enter the brain. You should know the different parts of the eye, so we've got the cornea, pupil, iris, lens, ciliary muscles, retina and optic nerve. Light receptors in the eye can be damaged by excess light, which is one of the reasons why you shouldn't look at the sun. So how does the eye ref protect itself? It does something called the iris reflex. In the iris reflex, when there's bright light, there is a change in the size of the pupil. And this means that the pupil constricts so that less light enters the eye, so they're not damaged. The reason why the pupil constricts is because the iris gets wider. The opposite happens when there's not enough light, you want more light entering the eye. So in a dark place, the pupil dilates. And when it dilates, that means it allows more light to enter the eye. And this means it gets bigger. And for that to happen, the iris has to get narrower. So how is light focused in the eye? How do we actually see an image clearly? So first we start off with light rays entering our eye. When they enter the eye, they enter through the cornea. This cornea is transparent to allow the light rays to enter. But it also causes the light rays to change direction and bend, and this is known as refraction. So light rays entering our eye are first refracted by the cornea. The light rays then reach the lens, and the lens fine-tunes the focusing so you can see an image clearly. And it does this through further refraction of the light rays. So light rays are refracted both by the cornea and the lens. And that further fine tuning of focusing by the lens means that the light rays can focus on the retina. And this produces the clear image that we can see.
So here's an example, we've got light rays that are entering the eye and when they get into the eye, they enter through the cornea which is transparent and then that cornea changes the direction of the light rays so it's causing the light rays to bend which is known as refraction and then there's further refraction by the lens which focuses the light rays onto the retina and because the light rays focus on the retina we can see an image clearly if the light rays don't focus on the retina the image cannot be seen clearly so what happens if we look at an object that's either close up or far away how does the eye change is if you look at something close up the image behind that becomes blurry whereas if you look at something far away the image at the front becomes blurry instead so that means there must be changes in the eye so that you could focus light when you're looking at something suddenly at distant or you're changing and you're looking at something that is a near object and when you look at these two images you can see that there is a change in the length so lens change shape to focus the light rays on the retina and we said earlier the lens causes refraction of the light rays so it either increases or decreases the amount of refraction so that the light rays can focus on the retina to see something far away the lens become thinner and becoming thinner means that the light rays enter the eye and when they reach the lens there is less refraction so having thinner lens means that the refraction is reduced and this causes the light rays to focus on the retina when you're seeing something close up the lens become thicker and because the lens become thicker this causes the light rays to refract more and by refracting more the light rays can focus on the retina so to summarize that to see something far away you want the lens to become thinner so that there is less refraction and to see an object that is close you want the lens to become thicker so there is more refraction and in both occasions the amount of refraction fine tunes the focusing so that the light rays can focus on the retina so you can see the example here if you want to see something that is far away you can see the lens becoming thinner and because it becomes thinner when the light rays reach the lens there is less refraction the amount of refraction is reduced however to see something close up the lens become thicker and this is by the ciliary muscles change causing the lens become thicker and because it's becoming thicker when the light rays reach the lens there is more refraction so the amount of refraction is increased and this means the light rays can now focus on the retina so now we should know all the different functions of the eye so we've got the cornea and this focuses light by refracting the light rays the pupil light enters the amount of light that enters or the size of the pupil is controlled by the iris then we've got the lens which is transparent just like the cornea it allows light rays to enter and where the lens is slightly different to the cornea is it does the fine tuning of the focusing of the light by changing shape by becoming either thinner or thicker and then you've got the ciliary muscles and they change the shape of the lens to make them thinner or thicker the light rays then have to focus on the retina and this detects the light so you can see the clear images and they have got two specialized types of cells called cone or rod receptor cells and then once the light is detected it's converted and sent as a message called an impulse to the brain through the optic nerve so here's a summary of the function and adaptations of the different parts of the eye you have to know how the adaptation links to the function of what those parts of the eyes do.
So we said earlier, if you want to look at an object far away, you want thinner lens because then there is less refraction so the light rays can focus on the retina. And to see something close up, you want thicker lens so the light rays could be refracted more so you could focus on the retina. But sometimes when you look at something far away, the lens doesn't become thin enough, it stays too thick. And because it becomes too thick, the light rays focus in front of the retina. And this means that you can't see an image clearly and this happens to people who are short-sighted. But the opposite happens to people who want to look at an object image that is close up. So when they look at an image that is close up, they want thicker lens. And the thicker lens means that there is more refraction. However, their lens is too thin, it doesn't become thick enough. And this means that the light rays don't refract enough and that means now they focus behind the retina. So let's look at both of these issues, short-sightedness and long-sightedness. And notice that if you know one of them, the long-sightedness one would be the opposite of the short-sightedness one. So you start off with short-sightedness. And you can see we want the light rays to focus on the retina to see a clear image. So the light rays enter the eye. And when they enter the eye, they're actually focusing in front of the retina for people who are short-sighted. There are three reasons why they might be focusing in front of the retina. It could be because the eyeball is too long. And then as we said earlier, if you want to see something far away, you want the lens to be thinner so that there is less refraction. However, sometimes the lens doesn't become thin enough. That means it's too thick. And because it's too thick, the light rays focuses there's too much refraction, as we mentioned, a thicker lens increases the amount of refraction and that means the light rays focuses in front of the retina. And then a third reason why people might be short-sighted is because the cornea is too curved. So just to rephrase that, the three reasons why you, someone might be short-sighted is because the eyeball might be too long or the lens is too thick or the cornea too curved. So notice for all three of them, it's too much of those three things. Too long eyeball, too thick lens, too curved cornea. And all three of those things could cause the amount of refraction of the light rays to increase. And because it increases, the light rays focuses in front of the retina. Now obviously you could correct this by wearing a specific lens. So if there's too much refraction, you want to spread the light rays before it refracts too much. And if you could, you could spread the amount of light rays by wearing diverging lens. And these diverging lens spread the light rays, they diverge the light rays before there's too much refraction. In other words, they're causing the amount of refraction to decrease. As I said earlier, long-sightedness would be exactly the opposite of short-sightedness. So if you remember short-sightedness, you can remember long-sightedness. So long-sightedness is for people who cannot see things that are close up. So if you want to see things that are close up, you want the lens to become thicker. So the problem would be either the lens is too thin, but then it could also be that the eyeball is too short or the cornea is not curved enough. And those three things could cause there to be less refraction. And because there's too little refraction, the light rays now focuses behind the retina. This means that what you want to do is you want to increase the amount of refraction. So the type of lens you can wear that will increase the refraction is called converging or convex lens. And converging or convex lens make the light rays come together or converge. Notice in the exam, you could either use the word converge or convex. They are both correct. But remembering converging is easier because converge means coming together. And then the same thing for diverging lens. You could also use the word concave instead. But if you remember diverging is to spread out the light rays. It's probably an easier word to remember. So to summarize that all again, for short-sightedness, the light rays focuses in front of the retina and this be could be because the eyeball is too long, the lens is too thick or the cornea is too curved. 
All three of those cause the light rays to refract too much. So what needs to happen to the light rays to focus on the retina? If the light rays refract too much, we want to spread them before they refract too much. So you wear diverging or concave lens and that spreads or diverges the light rays. For long sightedness, the light rays focuses behind the retina and if it's going to focus behind the retina, it could be because the eyeball is too short, the lens is too thin or the cornea is not curved enough. And this means that the light rays refract too little, there's not enough refraction. So what we need to do is refract the light rays more before they enter the eye because there's not enough refraction by the eye. And this is done by wearing converging lens or convex lens and they make the light rays come together more, in other words converge. And this increases the amount of refraction. Now there are other issues with the eye you also need to know. So for instance, the bottom picture is not caused by either short-sightedness or long-sightedness. It's because these light rays are being scattered and that caused by a cloudy lens. And this happens to people who have got cataracts. So cataracts is caused by having a cloudy lens that scatters the light rays. Another problem with the eye is some people cannot see certain colors and this is color blindness. We mentioned earlier in the retina there are two types of receptor cells so you've got cone receptor cells and they detect color and then rod receptor cells which detect light intensity. To remember both of them cone recept think about cones being colored so they're the ones that detect color whereas rods are the receptor cells located in the retina that detect the light intensity. People with color blindness have cones that do not work properly. Unfortunately, color blindness cannot be corrected. So here's a summary of all the issues. Short sightedness is where distant objects are blurry. As we mentioned, it could be the eyeballs too long or the corner is too curved or the lens not being thin enough because if you want to see something far away you want your lens to be thin. This means that the light rays are focused in front of the retina so there's too much refraction. The thinner lens would cause there to be less refraction so that's one of the issues and you could correct it by wearing diverging lens so that means you spread the light rays before it enters the eye where there's too much refraction. And then in long sightedness, it's for people who are, cannot see objects that are blurry because they're looking at close objects. And in these close objects, the eyeball is too short or the lens is too thin or the cornea is not curved enough. This means that the light rays is focused behind the retina. Because it's focused behind the retina, there's not enough refraction, so you increase the amount of refraction by a converging lens. And then color blindness is where colors cannot be seen, and this is because you've got cones that do not work well. Unfortunately, color blindness cannot be corrected. And then cataracts is when you've got a cloudy lens, so things appear misty or cloudy. This is because of the buildup of proteins in the lens. So it scatters the light rays and you can replace the lens with a plastic one. So cataracts can be corrected by replacing the lens in the eye with one that is plastic. We come up to the final topic in SP2 called the nervous system. There are two organs that make up the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. The rest of the nervous system is made up of the neurons, which are nerve cells. And the function of the nerve cell is to transmit electrical impulses around the body. Notice I'm using the word transmit instead of send, and the word electrical impulse instead of signal or message. These are the more the scientific terms. So neurons transmit electrical impulses around the body. Between neurons there are gaps and these gaps are called synapses. A synapse is a gap between two neurons and this creates a problem because when an electrical impulse comes along from one neuron it can't 
across the synapse. So what happens is when it reaches the end of one neuron this triggers the release of neurotransmitters which then diffuse across the synapse and bind onto the next neuron and when it does that it triggers a fresh new electrical impulse on the next neuron. So to re recap that at the end of one neuron there's a nerve impulse that's tra being transmitted. When it reaches the the end of that neuron, neurotransmitters are released into the synapse and they diffuse across the synapse. They bind and then de are detected by the next neuron and this causes a new impulse to be generated in that next neuron. You will also need to know how neurons are adapted for their function. In, term, in other words, what are the structures that make them specialize for their function. So a neuron has got dendrites and that receives the impulse. There's also dendron, then axon and then axon terminal which passes the impulse to other neurons. So how are they adapted? You've got to know three different things. First of all to understand it you've got neurotransmitters that diffuse across the synapse they bind onto this neuron and then when this neuron detects it a fresh new electrical impulse is generated that transmits across the dendrites through the dendron through the axon into the axon terminal and then once it reaches the end of the neuron which is the axon terminal this triggers the release of neurotransmitters to the next neuron. So to do this function what are the three adaptations we need to know? Well, first of all, if you look at the dendrons and the axons, they are long. And because they are long, they allow fast neurotransmissions to occur over long distances. Neurons also contain a myelin sheet, and that myelin sheet is a fatty layer that insulates the neuron to stop it from losing energy. And then also, you've got dendrites which receive electrical impulse and axons that transmit electrical impulse to other neurons and if you look at both the dendrites and the axons you can see that they are branched so that means that they can receive electrical impulses from lots of different directions and they could also transmit electrical impulses to neurons in other directions as well. Now to relate this to how the nervous system works in your body you need to understand that first there's a stimulus that's a change in the environment that we detect. We detect it using our sense organs such as the eyes, ears and skin and these sense organs contain receptor cells that detect the stimulus. For instance if there's a change in temperature which is the stimulus you will detect it with the sense organ skin and in that skin there will be receptor cells that detect the change. Another example is if there's a change in light. So that would be the stimulus, the change in the environment that happens. And you detect it using the sense organ eye. And in the eye, there'd be receptor cells that detect it. And we've actually mentioned the names of the receptor cells, cones and rods. So cones detect, as we said earlier, because cones are colored, they detect color. And rods detect light intensity. So that's one way to remember it. Notice that you do not need to know the name of receptor cells for all the other organs. The only ones you need to know the name of receptors are the eye. There are three different types of nerve cells or neurons that you need to know. So a sensory neuron is one of them and the sensory neuron's function is to transmit impulses from these receptor cells in the sense organ to the CNS, which is, could be either the brain or the spinal cord. You've also got two other neurons that you need to know You've got the motor neuron, which transmit impulses to effectors, and the relay neurons that transmit impulses from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. In other words, from one part of the CNS to another. So let's see how this works. So first there's a stimulus, and here you've got pain is a stimulus, and it's detected by the sense organ skin, so there'll be receptor cells 
in the skin that detect the pain and then once they're detected that an electrical impulse will be generated which is transmitted through the sensory neuron to the relay neuron so a sensory neuron the definition is to transmit electrical impulses from receptor cells in sense organs to relay neurons in the CNS either the brain or the spinal cord the relay neuron then transmits the electrical impulses from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron in other words one part of the CNS to another and then the function of the motor neuron is to transmit the electrical impulses from the relay neuron in the CNS to the effector which could be either the muscle or an endocrine gland and then at the end once it reaches the effector there is a response so in this case the muscles will be used to move the finger away now this is an example of a reflex action because it's a response that is automatic it's extremely quick and it's used to protect the body so this neuron pathway is called a reflex arc and one of the things with reflex arc is it usually bypasses the parts of the brain that's involved in processing it's a quicker response because you don't have to process that information you do it automatically you don't think about it so if you are touching a, a fire you don't think about the fact that you're touching fire you'd move it, your fingers away automatically so because it's automatic there's no processing involved it's done straight away and that's why it's called a reflex arc it involves a reflex arc so there is a reflex action so let's have a look at another example of a reflex action so first you start off with the stimulus so in this example here we've got someone being tapped with a hammer and that will obviously be detected by receptor cells in this case it will be pain receptor cells in the skin that information is then sent or is generated as electrical impulse that is sent to the CNS through the sensory neuron it reaches the CNS in this case it will be the spinal cord so it can bypass the brain and then to, you got to transmit that electrical impulse from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron through the relay neuron so one part of the spinal cord or CNS to another and then the motor neuron transmits the electrical impulse to the effector which is either a muscle or an endocrine gland in this case is the fire muscle and then the fire muscle is involved in the response in this case here the response is to co contract the muscle causing the leg to straighten we've learned about reflexes for instance the iris reflex where when there's suddenly bright or excessive light the pupils constrict because the iris becomes larger and this causes the pupils diameter to decrease reducing the amount of eye that enters the light so it doesn't damage the receptor cells located in the retina so here's an example of a reflex arc a light is switched on it's detected by rod receptor cells in the eye because those detect light intensity then electrical impulse is transmitted through the sensory neurons and we said this is a reflex arc because it's something that requires a quick response so it can protect the body so in this case you're trying to protect the retinal cells or receptor cells in the retina so it's a reflex action and it goes through relay neurons in the spinal cord or it could go to the unconscious part of the brain which doesn't have to do any processing and then the electrical impulse is going through the motor neurons the motor neuron transmits electrical impulses to the effector in this case it would be the iris muscle and the iris muscle therefore gets bigger which makes the pupil constrict decreasing the diameter Now that was one example of a neural pathway but sometimes the impulse is sent to the brain as well and this tends to happen when you're trying to process and make a decision so this is a conscious thought it's when you're trying to think of something so for instance here the stimulus is you see 
uh, some water you're using receptor cells in your eye to detect it that information is then transmitted through electrical impulse through the sensory neuron but this time it is going to the brain because you're processing that information to make a decision and the same thing it goes through relay neurons from one part of the CNS to another so from the brain to other parts of the CNS and then it gets the information gets transmitted through the motor neuron and then that motor neuron will then the electrical impulse will reach the effector in the muscle in your arms so that you can respond by drinking now the reason here that the impulse is sent to the brain is because you're processing the decision and this is a longer pathway of neurons and because it's a longer pathway of neurons it takes more time for the action to occur there are also more synapses and this slows down the transmission because neurotransmitters have to diffuse across the synapse and this is the reason why reflex arc or reflex actions are quicker because there are less less pathways of neurons there are less neurons through the pathway and also because there's less neurons there are also less synapses so this is the reason why reflex arc are a lot more quicker and that's why they're involved in rapid decisions whereas or rapid actions whereas using the brain involves decision making so let's do an example of an action that is not a reflex so here is a process response because you're processing the information so you smell your favorite food you're using again remember receptor cells and these have to be in the sense organ so these are smell receptor cells in the nose electrical impulses travel through the sensory neuron first then they get to relay neurons in the brain because you are processing that information and then to respond that electrical impulse is then sent through the motor neurons to the effector so in this case would be the leg muscle because the response is to walk towards the food so to make sure you understand the difference between a reflex arc and a process response the reflex arc is a lot faster there are less neurons during the pathway less synapses involved so this is a faster action it's an automatic action it could bypass the parts of the brain that's involved in processing so sometimes information can be sent to the unconscious part of the brain to make reflex action but usually it's the spinal cord whereas the process response always uses the brain and then both of them involve the sensory and motor neurons so here's another example of an impulse you can see here you've got stimulus you touch the flame we discussed this earlier but when it's using an automatic response and it's going through the reflex arc the impulse could still be sent to the brain but the brain is not involved in the response for instance when you're touching a hot flame you still feel that pain and you might say ouch and the reason why you're saying that is because your brain is processing it but to remove your hand or finger away from the flame you're using the reflex arc so that part or that response is done by the reflex arc the response where you're feeling the pain and you're responding by making a sound that would come through the brain so when you're receiving these impulses the impulse is actually sent to both the spinal cord and the brain but if it's a response where you're moving your hand or finger it's a, it's a response to danger you're bypassing the brain however that does not mean that impulses are still not sent to the brain but they're sent for other responses and we can see that here so here you touch the flame and we can see that it's detected by the sensory sense organs receptor cells and sense organs and you can see the response but during that response you can see that some of the impulse is still sent to the brain but that brain is not involved in lifting the hand so in the exam if it's a reflex arc you don't have to mention the part of the brain but do understand that impulses still get sent to the brain for other responses such as the fact that you've understood that you there was a danger and that's the completion of SB2